But I'd love to see a Carlton Collingwood. I think everyone would. Yeah. Carlton Collingwood Grand Final. Yeah. Maybe we can edit that so he doesn't hear it because I'd hate for him to, to hear people talking about him that way because he'd get a fat ahead. I don't need that added pressure of feeling it's a final and yeah. have to win it. Thanks for jumping in, mate. Um, I'm going to take you on a little journey. Not sure where we're going just yet, but we'll figure that out as we go along. Obviously, finals footy is upon us, and that's why we play footy, is to play finals and win premierships. You, whether it was your decision or someone else's decision, went from Collingwood to the to the arch enemies, um, but you played finals for both teams. So we're gonna go through that a little bit later on. Played in two grand finals for Collingwood and then went to Carlton and played in finals, which Carlton haven't done in a very, very long time. 10 years. And I know the, the faithful are very excited about about this year and what's in front of them. The lid's but off, the lid's off. The, the lid was off halfway through <laughs> the year. I tell you what, what was happening? Yeah. The memberships were out the window <laughs> at the start of the year, but but now the lid's off and Could they're be. on fire. They're in the they're the most informed team in the comp they at are. the moment. They go on well last night was um, a little bit disappointing, but um, but that's okay. We've got a couple of good players to come back in and the form's going well. It's exciting. What what do you think it was? Like everyone's talking about the boys got together and they had a bit of a drinking session and always just, helps them. Yeah, well the truth comes always. out. It's Christmas parties, same sort of thing. <laughs> the truth comes out in Christmas parties. Um, do you know, have you got any inside word of what actually went on and why um, they've turned their form around and now, as you said, they're the, the informed team in the comp? Uh, look, I don't have any uh, any inside uh, goss, but from, from the outside looking in, it just seemed like a bit of stability uh, off field, I, I think, all, all, always helps, you know, with uh, the question marks around Vossi and the club backing him in. I think that helps filter down the playing group, as you'd be aware, and then oh, I just think they've they really worked hard on their game around the defensive side. They, they look a bit pressuring opposition teams a hell of a lot more than what they were earlier in the year, and you know, creating that turnover and uh, being able to capitalise from it because we've got a very potent um, forward line, as we're aware of. But um, yeah, winning that ball back has, for me, has been a noticeable difference. What about the fact that Vossi's coaching Carlton, and you played against Vossi when he was at Brisbane yeah. in the like one of the best teams of all time when you were at Collingwood, and took it to the limit in one of those grand finals. Do you think he's brought that? Like, defense win premierships, we know that. Yep. Geelong are probably the, the outlier in that regard, but defense wins premierships. Do you think he's just like, you know what, He's he had the idea at the start, but then they didn't buy in, and now they've gone back to the well, and he's reiterated that defense wins premierships. Yeah, oh, certainly. And look, such a such a um, high caliber player, hard, hard player, and how could you not respect him um, as a coach when you know, he's, he's got all that respect as a as a player and a leader. So, um, yeah, he'd be, a, he'd be a coach you'd really want to play for. So, you know, obviously, there's always teething problems, but um, I thought I think he just brought a real great hard edge to, to Carlton uh, of late. And you, now, you, you're a player and now a coach. What is, what is, you're a coaching at Deer Park at the moment. Correct. What is your philosophy and who did you learn from? Obviously, you had Mick Malthouse as your coach, you've had um, a few coaches at Carlton, you went through Tony, them. Tony Shaw was yeah. the first. Oh geez, hopefully you didn't <laughs> learn anything off Tony. Um, and then obviously went through a few at Carlton. Who is, who is someone that you would say like, I learned the most off him or I base my coaching philosophy around them? I think you, you take bits and pieces from all, uh, good and bad, um, and your own experiences. Uh, one thing I've probably learned um, recent years around coaching now, it's, it's really, a lot of lot of time and um, energy around building relationships and uh, and that respect between player and coach. Um, yeah, we we probably I come through a career where coaches were a little bit more stern and harder, and that rubs off a little bit. But <laughs> you can't do that now. Um, and I've become old school. Yeah, I feel like uh, I've become more of a psychologist these days, and, <laughs> and then a coach dealing with uh, a multitude of issues. But I look, I still really enjoy football, and uh, obviously can't play anymore. So. Um, to, to be able to teach from you know uh, your own uh, lessons or um, experiences and try to you know uh, see improvement from individuals, uh, I really enjoy that. And you've obviously played. You said you're done and dusted. Now you're coaching. What is life after footy for 
Heath Skull, I know you've got your own business and you, you're wearing the hoodie right now, a bit of it's product right. placement there right go. there. There it is. Um, <laughs> what, are, what are you doing uh, with yourself and, and how has the transition been? Yeah, it was, look, the transition was sort of awkward at first. Um, yeah, I put all, all my eggs in the football basket as a as an adult or a young you know, kid coming coming into the system and didn't really have too much experience of anything else once I retired. Um, so I sort of had to find my way a little bit and fumbled my way into signage and you know, I own and operate my own signage company now. But with three kids as well and coaching, um, I thought thought life after footy might be a little bit more relaxed, but I've got <laughs> no time. It's going the other way. <laughs> Obviously a lot more stress because i got no hair anymore. And, um, is yeah, that I'm from the coaching busy. or from business? <laughs> Which oh, part? From, oh, probably from home life, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, look, I'm, I'm, you know, my, my kids are starting to get a bit older now. My oldest is 14, Riley, and Tyler's 12, and we've got a daughter, Frankie, who's seven. So they've got their um, their sports and, um, yeah, obviously with their schooling and you know just, just time with family is really important. And, you know, business, so apart from that, there's, you know, there's not much time to do anything else Bar, what, um, bar the footy stuff. I always like asking this question. What kind of father are you in terms of football? Because my old man, he used to stand on the other side of the ground away from everyone because he didn't want to talk to him. He just wanted to watch me play. Obviously, have his own opinion on things, but didn't want to go near anyone. Are you the father that is the coach that pushes his son hard and fast for AFL or are you the one that sits back and lets him do his own thing? Uh, look, I'm we try to make more of a conscious effort to sit back and let him do his own thing. I've seen players I've played with who are father sons and probably feel that pressure a bit. So, look, I, I love that my boys are playing football, but my oldest Riley, from sort of seven through to about 12, he was soccer and every he'd go, he'd take a soccer ball. It was his way of, of demonstrating that he's going to be him. Um, so, from now, I just look, I'll, I'll obviously give advice when he needs it. Now he's right into his football and doing well. He, he sort of seeks a bit of that, but generally I like to let uh, their coaches give them the lessons and just um, just enjoy the ride. Let the coaches coach, yeah, you reckon? exactly. Is, that's a rarity. You're letting someone else take control, which is, I find that very hard to believe. <laughs> so after a game, Riley's played a game, he's had an okay game or he's, he's been a bit average or whatever it is. What is, what's, what's the advice like? What's the feedback like? Or are you just sitting there just, summing it all up or do you go mate you could have done this better could have done that better or is it just a you know what there's always next week a bit of bit of both certainly if there's some parts of his game that like is he's he's at that age now where he's wanting that sort of feedback i suppose so um yeah we'll talk about how the game went and some different things he could he could do or what he did well but for me it's about him really enjoying it the one thing i love about watching my boys play footy is um just how much joy they get around all their teammates when somebody gets a goal that I, I really love the fact that both of them are very team orientated and they, they really um, really um, support their teammates and, and celebrate their their wins. Um, they're very selfless, so I really enjoy watching watching that camaraderie and that energy between the kids. It's it's you know, it's fun as a parent to, to see that. Now the last question I'm going to ask you about it, your sons are they as good left and right foot as you were because I'll be honest, you're one of the best on both sides that I've seen play. And I've I've been around for a long time. Um, I'm getting, Thanks, on, getting on a bit. But your left and right foot, it's, it's it's very rare that you see someone you don't actually know what foot they is their natural one. Are they the same or is it you've just like, let them go, one's a right footer, stick to the right. What's what's the go there? Uh, they're, they're, um, they practice play. both or not? Uh, look, I, I encourage them too, but um, yeah, look, again, I don't want to be overbearing there. Um, so, look, my oldest is a completely different player. He's a full forward and he's six foot one at 14. So, he's he's not going to be... Uh, so he's going to make the play. big bucks, not the halfback yeah, flankers yeah, well, like hope, you and me. Hopefully, he'll be kicking, <laughs> kicking goals. But, um, yeah, look, um, over the next couple of years, I think that's that's something I'll reiterate to them to make sure that they're working on, on both sides of the body because I think it's only an advantage. But at, uh, at the moment, they've got a little bit of work to do. Yeah, perfect, mate. Sounds good. Well, we're rocking up now to a pub. I know you Fantastic. like pubs, yes. but we're going to go in there and we're going to have a, a little chat, a little bit more deep about, obviously, footy and Carlton and Collingwood playing finals. All right, Scott, I know you've been in a lot of pubs in your life. Um, now we're going to play a little bit of pool and we're going to chat about, obviously, footy finals the clubs you play for, your AFL career, and 
the clubs that are playing in this year's finals, which is Carlton and Collingwood. So you break, yeah, kick us off, and away we go. Go away. Hope I can hit the ball. Don't miss. So, mate, you started your career at Collingwood under Tony, Correct. who was a very average coach, um, and then Mick came like along it. and got Collingwood to two grand finals. You played in both, but it's fair to say that you and Mick weren't the best of mates. Like, <laughs> he loved me and Mick. I was the Heath that he liked, and yeah. you were the Heath yeah. that he didn't like. Oh, so what was, the, what was the, the relationship side. like? Oh, it was different. Um, oh, look, uh, to be honest, I know um, it was, uh, didn't work out in terms of player-coach relationship, but he's a coach that I really respected and wanted to play for. Unfortunately, it was a situation where I really wasn't, um, I felt I wasn't getting opportunities or able to showcase what I could do, and probably wasn't in mix ultimate sort of best side so after a few years um, that's why I sort of looked for opportunity elsewhere. He's, he's pretty good Mick, I'm like, I know I love Mick so I wouldn't say a bad word but he's pretty good in the fact that he will just tell you as it is like he would say you're not in my best 22 I'll use you when I need you but if I don't you're out the door. Pretty much. Um, so for you you still played in two grand finals like what was mm. that like having to like, play in two grand finals and then make that decision I'm gonna leave I'm gonna leave the club that I've played good football for and in a successful team but then go to another club? Oh, it, was, it was really hard to be honest. Um, when I sat there and asked for a trade with um, Neil Baum, I broke down, broke down in tears. He goes, what are you upset for? And I said, look, I don't, didn't want to leave but felt I had to after, after five years and um, what I felt was limited opportunities. And, and the irony, as you said, playing, even though my, my opportunities to play senior footy were limited and back then when I did get opportunities, game time was really scarce. Um, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to come in for the main, main parts of it, but look, that year in 2003, um, I'd only played sort of six games leading to the finals and the writing was on the wall at that stage. I think Nick Stevens was, was looking like coming to Collingwood. Um, the midfield was pretty much sort of sewn up with the, the personnel I had there and I knew my opportunities going forward were going to be even less, um, you know, even less than so. Uh, it was more out of necessity for me, I felt after five years, if I probably didn't make a break, I might have finished my career a year or two later. So you ended up going to the arch rivals, which we all know is, is a tough decision to leave a club, but go to the arch rivals even, even tougher. But you're a chance to go to North Melbourne. How did, like, what happened there? You were going to go there, but then ended up in Carlton. What was the, yeah, that what was, was the scenario? Yeah, 2001 that was. So that was the first, uh, it was a couple of years earlier. And um, I'd end up, uh, I played round one that year um, and didn't get a game until round 22. And round 22 was, we, we couldn't make finals. So uh, I got an opportunity and had a really good game against North Melbourne up in um, Canberra. Suppose that Dennis had touched base about um, um, Matt wanting to meet. And I'd spoken to Collingwood the day before and said, look, I'm meeting with Dennis in North Melbourne. If things go well, I might look for a trade. Um, the following day, um, I met Dennis and everything went well. He goes, look, listen, son, he goes, we're going to get you over, but whatever you do, don't tell Collingwood I've met, we've met, and because they're going to try and obviously do it sneakily. And big mistake, I, uh, I didn't tell him that I'd already told him. The Wednesday, they walk into uh, to the trade talks and, uh, and the first thing that um, yeah, the guys at the prize must have said, so are you interested in East Scotland? And Dennis Pagan rings me up, said, I told you not to say anything. You're not a man of your word, son. That's it, the deal's off. And I'm like... Oh no, so no yeah, he just terminated, but uh, obviously um, uh, out of principle, so look, I learned a lesson there, and then the two years later with, uh, again, sort of limited opportunities and, and, op and an opportunity he probably felt to get me across, uh, he, he reached out again, and that sort of come through Brendan Favola, who I'd struck up a good friend friendship with through um, the under-18 carnival, and yeah, uh, as it turned out, that's where we went. Playing at two huge clubs, like obviously the fan base is massive, even like, to this day. I think people want to see a Collingwood Carlton grand final this year because yeah. no one will be going off its head. Be huge. Supporter base, obviously, Collingwood supporter base is huge. Vic Park, you were there at Vic Park days yeah. before they moved in and then going to Carlton. What is what was the difference and how did the, the supporters sort of embrace you? Because it's hard because you do you did get drafted by Collingwood, you did play for Collingwood. Yep. You played in grand finals for Collingwood, but then you go to Carlton and you throw on that navy blue jumper. Was there people still a bit hesitant about you because you were Collingwood or did they embrace you with both arms and then you obviously played um, 10 years or so with them? Uh, yeah, look, embraced really. Um, I'm sure there was supporters out there that were um, that probably didn't like it both on both sides. But um, but uh, look, yeah, walking in, it's, you know, you know, it's like you, you went through it yourself when you go from club to club. Uh, it's, you know, you, you, you're embraced and you embrace sort of everything about that club. But look, as a kid, 
I was a I was a Footscray supporter and just an obsessed Footscray supporter. And the two clubs I actually hated were Collingwood and Carlton, believe it or not. <laughs> it always works did, out that way, didn't I like it? them? And then got drafted, obviously, to Collingwood and couldn't stand the Bulldogs and um, and didn't like Carlton and then quickly uh, quickly turned to, to Carlton. And look, I'm a, I'm a Carlton man now, but uh, the, um, the the sort of funny thing about early Oren is some of my, you know, my best mates, obviously, are the Pies guys. And, and when you go back about making that decision and, and coming across and how difficult it might have been, that was probably one of the hardest parts of the with friendships I sort of I, I made over those sort of five years. Um, to leave and look for opportunities at another club um, and sort of leave your mates, that was probably the really, really hard part. But, but fortunately, 20 years later, um, still very good mates with all those guys. You played your best football, um, obviously, at Carlton. You won a best and fairest there and you played finals there. Mm -hmm. You're one of the latest, the last people to play finals for Carlton. Mm -hmm. And obviously this year, locked their spot in and they're ready to roll. Where do you see the club at the moment? Because obviously, go back to the start of this year and calling for everyone's head. The president yeah. needed to go, the coach <laughs> needed to go, the players' leadership was terrible, the forwards are struggling, everything was going wrong. But now, they're actually the biggest threat in the finals. What do, what do you think the change was? And, and how does, obviously, that supporter base and people from the outside looking in, how do they see that? Oh, I think everyone's excited. Um, I think, look, I think the off-field structure uh, um, and really getting that right of, of recent times, obviously, with Sayers and Brian Cook coming on board, I think... Um, been been invaluable to how that's flowed down into the playing group. Obviously, the the coaching structure, you know, a lot of respect for Vossi and the way he played and the leader he is. Um, again, I'm not on the inner sanctum, but I could only imagine the players are really wanting to play for him and um, that that support or that um, um, I, I faith and and and, and support in, in their coach mid year when the chips were down in yester years. I suppose that's when the coaches were under pressure and, and that stability to, to keep me involved. I think. Um, Help the footy club. It showed players. a bit. It oh, showed a bit because definitely. they could have easily gone, nah, this is done. Oh, because the list they've got, like everyone talks yeah. about the list, the number one draft picks, the players they have, Cripps, Brownlow medalist, Kerno, um, obviously winning the goal kicking and all that sort of stuff. Weedering in the back line, he's one of the best. You got, yeah. you've got everything there, so yeah. they should be playing finals. And at the start of the year, they weren't. And it's like, all right, do we throw the the, the toys out of the cot, or yeah. do we just stick to it? And it looks like they have. Oh, certainly. And I think with Carlton, the one thing I noticed coming into Carlton all those years ago was the expectation of, of winning. Um, it's been a lean 20 years, but um, Carlton's culture is about, about success and winning. So that expectation's there. So when the club does dip, when we've got high-talented high players and, um, and the expectations we should be playing finals and that's sort of not going to, to plan um, like it was early in the year, that's when generally the... the Do you think the modern-day player struggles with that? Because oh, no doubt. No. Obviously, you're the old school. Yep. And you, you said it before, you were talking about the coaches, they give it to you, like, go hard and fast. It's a bit different these days. Do you think they struggle a little bit with their expectation? Because you do get drafted or you do get traded and everyone talks about how big the money is these guys are on. But does that, that added pressure affect some of the players these days more so than it did, say, 10 years ago when you were playing? Oh, I think it'd have to. Um, fortunate, you know, in my time, you know, social media was really just coming in the back end of it. But now, everything's out there. Kids, guys, everyone's on their phones flat out. Stats, contents stats contents through there, stats through there, you know, feedbacks through there, you know, <laughs> like everyone's got an opinion. So um, players would be reading it. It'd be very hard to, to avoid it. So it'd just, it'd be one of those snowballing things. So I think they'd have to feel all that pressure. Um, but also, you know, on the flip side, when things are going well, they can ride that energy in that wave. So uh, I think that's sort of what's happened a bit with Carlton as well. Like they're probably in a bit of a that low period and it just, was flowing on, but once they've kicked through and they're riding that sort of high wave at the moment, it's great. Well, they've got a guy leading them that's played in a few successful teams, mm. probably one of the best of all time. How does that look going into September? You've got a guy who's won, who's captained three premierships and played in grand finals galore. How do you think, what's his approach going to be? Is it stick to the process or does it go back to the well and talk about what his team did back in the day? Because they beat Collingwood. Collingwood were obviously weren't the most talented team mm -hmm. going around, but they got there. Um, Lions were obviously the best talented or the most talented team, and they won those premierships. What, what is he going to do? Because he's obviously got a talented group. So how do you reckon, what's his approach going into September? And for them, they're the most dangerous team outside of the top four. Yeah, um, don't know. Look, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think you'd have to, yeah, and you'd expect him to, to sort of relay a bit of his experience. He's been there. Uh, he's he obviously through, you know, Prior to Brisbane becoming the powerhouse, 
yeah, they clawed their way up from the bottom with it when you had know, a highly talented list. Um, yeah, and they were very successful. So that did that experience in Luke Powell's down there, I believe, as well. So that experience and what they've gone through, I think rubbing off to the to the players would be great. But also, as you know, I think it's just keeping it normal. Uh, it's finals, there's a lot riding on it, but I think the players have just got to relax a bit and realise it is another game. Yeah, there's 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 more on the line, but um, don't do anything different. What's been what, what they've been doing in the back end of the season's been working. Their game plan's there. Um, they don't need that added pressure of feeling it's a final and yeah. have to win it. Like just, I think I think Fossey would be wanting to keep it as normal as possible. So for you, you're a, you're a back pocket. I was going to say you're a half back flanker, but you're a back pocket. Um, cut and grind your way through your 250 odd games. Who do you think's the most important player? for Carlton going into this final series? Because everyone will say Cripps, Kerno, um, and all the big names like that. Who do you think is the most important player for Carlton for this final series? They have to play well for them to, to make a dint in this Oh, uh, look, I think, you know, it's, it's the obvious one with Charlie, when he's when he's firing, um, they're going well. But, um, you know, weedering down back, I hope he doesn't, um, weedering down back, I hope he, uh, he doesn't get suspended. Um, but I, I actually think, um, and I love him as a player. I think George Hewitt can have such a huge impact. Um, and what he does for our midfield is great. So, look, the, the, as you said before, the, the list is highly talented and they're going to need them all to play well to, to go, go deep. And, and I think they can. Yeah, so George Hewitt, the tagger. We know, no one likes a tagger, mate. But he play, they play an important role. And I know I've played on George a few times. And you've got to be, you've got to be disciplined. We saw um, Hawthorne tagged. Dacos mm-hmm. earlier this year. So coming up into a final series, would you just say to Georgie, mate, this every week you go, mate, this is your guy, you're just on him and everyone else help you out, but the rest of you just have to play your, your natural game? Oh, certainly. Oh, look, I'm a, I'm a big believer on limiting the impact of the of opposition's best players. I know it's probably less common these days, but um, if you can stop the impact of the team's best ball winners um, and stop them at the source, I think it goes a long way to to winning a game of football and certainly Carlton's midfield's really strong and if they can get hold of that part of the game, um, you know, it's going to put them in good stead to win. In your coaching philosophy, mm-hmm. do, you, do you have a tagger for your team? Or is I, do. It, I do, You do have a tagger, do, yes. so you've got, a, you've got someone you dedicate that like role that. to and you're obviously old school coach as much yep. as an old school player, yep. know your role, play your role. Mm-hmm. Um, is that philosophy, did you learn a little bit of that of obviously Dennis Pagan or Mick Malthouse, like? You spoke about it a little bit before and touched on you. You got a bit out of both. But who is the most sort of influential player? Or do you just coach? Or do you just go about your own sort of philosophy in, in terms of that? And obviously the modern game's a bit different to when you played. Yeah, I look, from, from my philosophy, it's, yeah, as, as I said, it's learning. Um, it's probably implementing things I learned along uh, playing career from those coaches. But having a, having a really strong sound team defence is important. Um, you know, control and balance at the source, you know, you know around your stoppage, uh, your stoppage games, making sure that we're in you know, good, strong defensive positions first to win the ball back. But then, yeah, we all like the footy in our hands, don't we? So being able to take the game That's on and play, with a, little, yeah. play with a little bit of flair is, is hugely important. And you know, being bogged down, just focusing on defence too much, I think, can become stale. Um, so you know, taking the game on, playing with a bit of flair and speed is just as important. So, yeah, you tried to have, I tried to have that balance. Um, but as far as the midfield, I think having a de- defensive-minded mind and mid in there can help with midfielders who all want to win the football just to give you that bit of a balance at, at the goal face. Talking about flair, now this is going to be a tough question, <laughs> or it could be an easy question, either one. You played at two big clubs, you played with some pretty good players. Who's the best player you played with and who's the best player you played against? Because you're going to burn some bridges here, yeah. no matter what happens. No, that's right. Because you played with some absolute yep. rock stars at Collingwood and Carlton. Who's the best player you played with? Uh, it doesn't have to be that, the most talented. No, that, that, that's a really hard one because I, I look, and it's a long, going to be a long answer here, but look, I, I started and Gavin Brown was playing when I started, but he was, he was sort of on the, the back couple of years. Um, you know, Paul LeCurie, unbelievable work. Chris Tarrant, you know, with, with, with his, um, biceps. his biceps and ability, <laughs> obviously. Dane Swan was just starting out. Nathan Buckley won a Brownlow. Um, you know, Chris Judd, Anthony Kudafidis at, at, at Carlton, and, and Kuda was captain but his last couple of years. But probably the one that always really comes to mind is, um, is Fev. I just watched when we were a, our first time watching, playing with him, when we were um, a side battling at Carlton, um, him being able to turn games off his own boot. Um, please, 
Um, maybe we can edit that so he doesn't hear it because I'd hate for him to, to hear people talking about him that way because he'd get a fatter head. But um, no, nah, look, I think you're splitting hairs with so many quality players, but, um, but he, him for me stands out based off what he was able to do in a side that was probably struggling in that period. Yeah, kicking goals is hard. Yep. You see Larky this year. Larky's kicked 60 odd goals playing a team that's finished on the bottom of the ladder. Um, and then you've got Charlie Kerno who's up the top. So obviously, kicking goals is hard. You're a defender. Who's the hardest forward you've played on? Oh, obviously, yeah. you would have been you would have been in the the Cousins era. Yeah, all those sort of guys. I played on Ben as the hardest opponent I've ever played on was Ben Cousins. Yep, he started a half forward and I didn't see him for the whole game because <laughs> he, he actually ran too hard for me. Um, but all the small forwards like Eddie Betts and these guys, you played with him. I played mm-hmm. against him. Who's the, who's the hardest forward you've you've played on and matched up against? Yeah, well, uh, actually, probably one of the toughest games I had was uh, Ryan Crowley tagging me off half back flank one day and. Uh, running past the ball and um, as you know as a halfback flank you're sort of waiting for the ball to come to you a little bit more than going to get it yourself so that was a tough day um, Shannon Grant I remember playing on him one day and um, yeah, obviously as a halfback flanker I tried to want to win the ball more than defend I suppose and um, you know always sort of trying to, trying to get, uh, build your offence I probably overbalanced it one day and he kicked three and a quarter and a half and taught me a valuable lesson but um, look the really small dangerous forwards fortunately uh, I tried to avoid those matchups and give them to someone like a Dennis Armfield. But um, um, yeah, look, Gary Ablett, I played on him a couple of times and obviously it was always always scary and you, you're worried about every minute of the game, every second of the game. But um, look, probably one of the, um, you know, the best players I've probably played against that you asked before was the, the, the coach leading Carlton, Michael Voss. I, I just, the way he played his footy was um, was inspiring to see from, from the other side of the fence. Yeah. But, um, yeah, and look, I played on him for small periods and it wasn't a, um, it wasn't a great task, that's for sure. <laughs> so explain to me, because obviously you've played 250 games, which is not an not a easy achievement. With all these players you played with, obviously Juddy, Kudafidis, you're speaking about, Mark Murphy, yep. um, Bryce Gibbs and all these. How did you win a best and fairest? <laughs> like, honestly, like, explain to me how, I oh, know I won, I won one. It took me a while to get there, but half-back flanker with all these guys playing in your team. You won, a, you won a best and fairest at Carlton. That's a pretty big achievement that not many people would know. Yeah, um, look. Even was, with Fev there kicking was, goals. Uh, Fev was gone by then at that you stage, but I was uh, it's pretty good at getting rats, rats as coffees uh, first thing in the morning, to be honest. <laughs> uh, we had the cafe there, and I'd always make sure I had a nice warm one for him, which goes a long way. Um, no, look, I think we looked that year too. We had a couple of blokes missed games from injury, so I was quite fortunate, I suppose, that I was able to stay in the park. Uh, play consistent footy and um, look edged out Eddie. Um, that's something I'm, I'm sort of proud of. You don't play for, for those um, sort of accolades, but um, yeah, I suppose that to, to know you had an impact, um, yeah, and, and had a good year and were rewarded for it was was you know was great. Something I'll, I'll always cherish. For me though, the, probably the, the biggest honour I had individually in footy was just becoming a life member of of Carlton because. Um, yeah, that acknowledges time you've given to a club and, and service over, over a sustained period. So, um, yeah, that was probably one of the most pleasing individual, and well, he's the most pleasing individual accolade I reckon I've got. And so this, this year, I know, I already know the answer, but going into this final series, you want Carlton to make the grand final. Who's the, who's the opponent? Who do you think will make the grand final? Would you love the fact that it was a Carlton kind oh, of grand final? My word. Because I know the MCG only holds 100,000, but we could fit 120 there easily if Carlton and Collingwood managed yep. to find their way into a grand final. Do you think they're the, they're the team to beat, Collingwood, or is there someone else that you're more worried about for Carlton? Uh, Brisbane, I think, will be, be, be difficult, but I'd love to see a Carlton. I think everyone would. Yep. Carlton, Collingwood, grand you. final, yeah. Look, obviously, as I said, I'm, I'm a Carlton man, but... Um, and I'll be praying we won, but if we didn't, I'll, I'll just chuck the jumper off and chuck the black and white on for, <laughs> for, for a <laughs> Nah, no, look, it'd be, on a serious note, it'd be, it'd be great, and I think it'd be, it'd be great for footy just to have those two powerful clubs in a grand final, and every chance, I think Collingwood, will, you know, they'll, they'll get their game back going, I know they've hit a bit of a slump at the moment, but um, yeah, finals footy's a different game, and they've got the experience, they've got the quality, so they've been the best side all year. Um, the only other one, if those two sides aren't in there, um, I'd love, uh, I'd love to see Port actually for, for Zachy Butters. So, um, yeah, it'd, it'd, be, it'd be an interesting final series, so I'm looking forward to it. Sleeping Giants, Port Adelaide. It'd be good to see them as well. Imagine Collingwood, Carlton, or Port Adelaide. It'd be, the yeah, MCG would be going off. But, mate, thanks for, thanks for joining us. We've got a trip down memory lane, and there's not, as I said, there's not many people that have played finals for both.
Collingwood and Carlton in the last 20 years, you've done that best and fairest, a couple of grand finals in there and hopefully Carlton can get there this year. But um, thanks for joining me, mate. Appreciate no worries, it. Mate. Thanks for having me. No worries.